come Holy Spirit and give us that mysterious rapport of speaking and listening, that what is said and what is heard may be useful to you and to your kingdom for Christ's sake. Amen. You be seated. Well, I hope that your Christmas is uh, somewhere nigh complete at this point. Uh, you have gone out and purchased a tree. You got it home by some means. Uh, you added water, if you're wise, and also an additive in the base to keep things green. You have strong lights. You've hung decorations. You've written Christmas cards. You've opened Christmas cards. You have purchase gifts for your friends and family and associates. You have wrapped the gifts, you delivered them, and you've opened your own. You've heard carols sung, among some of which we are singing this morning. Uh, your family has gathered. Uh, people have had a festive time together. Gifts have been exchanged. The feast has been consumed. And you're writing thank you notes. Is that complete? It sounds like a long list to me, and perhaps, only perhaps, uh, your life is back to where you left it somewhere back in the Advent season. Perhaps some of you even have done some pondering in your own mind about what all this might mean. Uh, is it worth all the efforts that you've gone through to assemble uh, this scene? Has anything been left out? Has anyone been left out? And what are the hopes about anyway? Looking back on my own Christmas celebration, I've always been provoked by it all to try and drill down a little deeper to see what all of this effort is about and what things might actually mean, at least for me. And this morning I am making bold to tell you what I think about what all this means, at least to me. And so in what I have to share with you this morning, I hope will provoke your own thinking. Uh, perhaps it'll provoke some thinking about me. You never can tell about that. And you will know something a little more about what difference all of this might make in the longer run. Uh, as a representative uh, person asking these questions, I'm turning to a very unlikely source from my years of reading Peanuts cartoons. I'm going back to the Christmas angel herself, Lucy. And we're finding Lucy on a cold Christmas Eve, all bundled up, as I presume most of you all were, lying in her bed with her eyes wide open, pondering what all of this from Christmas trees and festive gatherings might mean. And she goes on to think, so here it is, Christmas Eve, but there's no sleigh bells outside my window tonight, she says with a grim face. Why? Because I have totally rejected the concept of a fat guy in a red suit for the first time in my life. For once I feel free, once I am detached from all of what is around me. What was that? I thought I heard a sleigh bell. Why can't a person ever be sure? Why can't a person ever be sure? And there are enough aspects to the Christmas story and the implications of the Christmas story. So I think that many people, when they really think about it, wonder about what they can be sure of indeed. Because there are many dimensions, many dimensions to the Christmas celebration that often go unnoticed, lying right underneath the surface of everything else. And so I'm going to tell you about those dimensions going from ones that are fairly simple and easy to understand to something that has me even baffled about its own mystery. So if you can follow this, you're doing very well. If you can't follow it, just wait till next year and drill down on your own time and in your own place. First of all, the easy part is, as you probably know, there are four gospel readings. Uh, each gospel reading has got its own nativity story. They're not alike. They're rather different. That's because they were written at different times and in different places for different audiences to hear them. And so I'm going to give you a brief run-through 
of the four Gospels and what they have to say about what we think we just celebrated, the nativity of the birth of Christ in Jesus. Notice I say the birth of Christ in Jesus. More about that later. First of all, there's the Gospel of Mark. And Mark was written probably around 60 AD, which is roughly 30 years after the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth. And uh, the Gospel reading for Mark is unusual in the narrative, and then it begins with his baptism. There's no angels, no camels, no stars, only a baptism. And I suspect when I think about it, that's because Jesus probably being the unusual person he must have been, probably pondered long and hard as he was growing up about his own character and his own identity, which probably in all likelihood did not correspond to anybody else's around him. And so he hears about this man, John the Baptist, who is out there in the wilderness proclaiming things that are probably provoking, and he probably makes the decision to go down and be baptized as a further possibility of better understanding his own identity. And what he gets is the Holy Spirit and the realization that he has a special relationship to God. That is a birth narrative because that is when Jesus, as an important person for Mark, was born. Everything before that, not much happened. The second gospel, Matthew, written sometime after Mark, (laughs) is written to a group of early Jewish Christians. And so uh, Matthew takes a rather uh, Jewish Old Testament approach to his interpretation of the birth of Christ and Jesus, and he does it by virtue of genealogy. Uh, If you read the Gospel of Matthew, it begins with, with Abraham to David, from David to the Babylonian exile, from the Babylonian exile to Jesus. That's 14 generations, 48 different groups of people, and Joseph is engaged to Mary, who is pregnant. That's what you get largely from Matthew, a genealogy describing the significance of Jesus of Nazareth. Then, of course, we come to the manger scene. There is Luke's story displayed for you, and probably in your own home, and in the homes of people that you have gathered around you. That is the most familiar birth narrative, but that's the only one that's like that in the Bible. And Jesus is special for gynecological reasons. He's born of a virgin. And so, being born of a virgin, he must have been a special person which helped to illustrate why he became the person that he was. Mary is overshadowed with the Holy Spirit, and the birth is out uh, different than a normal birth conception. Ah, oh, and then what came, to, what came to just what you heard, the Gospel of John. That is the most mysterious one of them all in my own mind, and I suppose, to be candid about it, probably my own favorite, although I like Mark and I like Luke. And so John's narrative <coughs> was written as a prologue, the beginning to his gospel reading, so I suppose That is in the right place in the sequence of things. And the significance of Jesus is that he bore the presence of something called the Word, uh, the Word referring to that which stands behind something or is the meaning of something or the basis upon which something has been created. Uh, The Greek word for that is logos. And uh, the Gospel goes on to say that this logos or word or presence became flesh and lived among us, full of grace and truth. And so birth, I think, for the Gospel of John is the recognition of that. And when you recognize that, then you've got the birth. And if you don't recognize that, the birth has probably happened to you. So, there you have it. No wonder Lucy and many other people are not too sure about the whole thing because the narrative varies between people. And in that narrative, uh, there's a big contradiction. The contradiction is between what is transcendent, what is eminent, what is eternal, and which is temporal, what is finite, and what is limitless. Lots of contradictions 
when you really begin to look and see what surrounds what you generally see and understand of the birth of Christ in Jesus. Three out of the four of those uh, narratives have a word, and this is a provocation, have what I call written as myth. Oh dear, here it begins. Now most people believe that myth is an untruth. That is an inaccurate description of meaning of the word myth, which originally meant a story which has been developed to tell a larger story. Or as one of my friends once said, something that didn't happen that's true. Now that's a contradiction, isn't it? Something that didn't happen, but is nonetheless true. And the really big stories in Scripture, the ones that are hard to comprehend and get their arms around, are generally written as a myth or a story which is created to tell a much larger truth or a much larger reality. And so part of the difficulty in, in con coming to terms with the stories about the nativity are that some of those are mythological, and if you try to read them literally, they don't make a lot of sense. They were intended to be read mythically and not in terms of making a lot of sense. Now, provocation goes further. Why did Mark, Matthew, and Luke employ myth, or the big way of telling a story, in terms of talking about the birth of Christ and Jesus? This is my point of view. Needn't be yours, but I hope you will think about it. My sense is that early Christian thinkers were forced to work backward from the resurrection to the birth. There was something about Easter that made Christmas a necessity. What was there about Easter that had to make Jesus a different person, a different character, as described in the birth narratives? Well, the reason for that, briefly, and this is really an Easter sermon in about two minutes, the reason for that is because the disciples upon the death of Jesus realized that Christ had been in the world after Jesus. That is to say, they kept running into the presence of, the presence of Christ that they had known in Jesus in other people, in other times, in other places. And when they read between the lines in the Old Testament, they began to see that incognito, the same presence was present then too. So there was a pre-Jesus and a post-Jesus that was normatively expressed by the life of Jesus of Nazareth. And to understand what a huge difference that would have made in his life, they had to be able to say something about how his birth must have been miraculous and different to explain it. That's just how people read things and wrote things in the first century when the Gospels were written in the first place. So in order to be able to have an Easter, you had to have a Christmas to describe the significance that was of, of the birth of Jesus in the terms of how Jesus was born. To my way of thinking, no Easter, no Christmas. Think about it. No Easter, no Christmas. No reason for Christmas. No reason for the myth in the first place. Now, still here? Maybe. Maybe. This is going to take you far afield. This next one is really a big thought, which to me is a mysterious way of understanding the prologue to the Gospel of John, or John's birth narrative. A word of background. Uh, I subscribe to a bi-monthly publication called the New York Review. That's not the New York Times Review. That's a separate uh, publication. Comes out twice a month in big, big, a big form. I read it. My father gave it to me years ago, thinking it might be helpful. It's been remarkably helpful, and I'm vastly helped by what I'm going to share with you this morning. It was about a year ago, I was reading through the New York Review, and I came across a review of a book which is entitled Incomplete Nature. And the title to the review was, are you ready? Can anything emerge from nothing? Can anything emerge from nothing? Well, you say to yourself, that really is a contradiction, isn't it? It's bad enough that we have enough contradictions surrounding the birth narrative, 
But here you've got one saying something about anything emerging from nothing. The reviewer is a physicist. The author of the book is a physicist. The reviewer does not like the author and really condemns what the author has written because I suspect what the author had to say went way past the imagination of the reviewer. And it goes past even my imagination, but it's got something to do with the prologue to the Gospel of John. I will read you the relevant quotations from the way in which the reviewer quoted the book. Here it is. Reality includes apparent absences. Reality includes apparent absences as well as presences. Absences are part of the causal structure of the universe. I'll do that again. Absences are a part of the causal structure of the universe. Logos. There is something not there that is there. Without this missing something, the world be just plain simple physical objects lacking impressive attributes. Nature is incomplete or without an absent character. There's something there. It isn't measurable. It's not definable. You can't reach out and experiment with it. But it must be there for things to be the way they are. That leads to a contradiction in human logic. The world includes absential phenomena which are not naturally present. A physicist wrote the book, and a physicist wrote the review, and the reviewer does not like, does not like what the book says. But the book says something that Christians ought to be able to somehow latch a hold of and at least wonder about. And so for this Christian, as I struggle with drilling down on the birth narrative and the fact that there would be no Christmas without Easter, I have to think about a mega spiritual reality referred to in pre-scientific thinking as the Logos, or the Word which was in the beginning and was with God and was God. And through him, or her, all things came into being. Not one thing came into being except through him, her. What has come into being in him, or her, was life. And that life was the light of men, women. That light shines in the darkness, and darkness could not overpower it. And so Jesus' birth, John's birth narrative is about a birth that is not just another infant, but originally present as the Logos, which was born in the, present, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Imagine that which was in the beginning 13.7 billion years ago was somehow found in the presence of a very discreet, identifiable, measurable, knowable person. My, my, my. That is a real provocation, and it has been that for me. Lucy voices the mystery. Why can't a person ever be sure? <laughs> because to be sure, you've got to go way beyond the usual forms of assurance that we carry within ourselves. Well, are you still here? Probably not. If I've led you far astray in your thinking, the real Christmas story will lead you far astray from your usual place, way beyond trees, Christmas carols, thank you notes, gifts that can be ordered uh, by Amazon that don't refer to the gift of Christ and Jesus, but just something you think somebody else would like to have, way beyond all of that. And so I wish that you will enter a new year with a sense of mystery. If not, it'll be the same old year. You'll come back to it next year during Advent and something will happen at Christmas time and you'll say, what did that fellow say about the absences that must be present to have a complete universe? What was that again? What was that in the beginning? Who was that Logos? Logos born in someone? Why, that isn't likely. That's a contradiction. You bet it's a contradiction. It's one that nobody that I know of or has ever lived has got a clear understanding about. Well, I'm going to conclude with something that will be a little more satisfying to you. Uh, this, is, this is a poem from an, uh, an old Christmas pageant. Uh, it sounds rather Christmassy, and it does sound English, and it goes like this. O maid and holy child, where have ye gone? 
Lost are the voices, sets the star that once shone. Back to their folds have gone the shepherd band. Each king is now returned to his own land. Love has gone forth into the world to win saints to their rest and sinners back from sin. Gentiles, O ye that have watched our play, tell me, I pray, did he pass your way? Say, have you him safe, each one in his breast? Oh, hold him well, so shall we all have rest. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, the love of God, the Holy Ghost's accord be with us all, and heaven be our reward.